A rumor that Alexander was on the way could clear the streets of bystanders or empty a theater. Yet despite the terror campaign, the emperor still championed reform. He announced plans for a new legislative council. For the first time in Russian history, a Tsar proposed to share his power. Sunday, March 1, 1881. Tsar Alexander II planned to publish his proposed balance of power with his new legislature on Tuesday morning. In 48 hours, Russia would be on the long road to parliamentary rule. But for the terrorists of the Narodnaya Polya, reform could only start with the death of the Tsar. Sofia Perovskaya and her comrades had staked out the route Alexander took to the palace that Sunday afternoon. With the drop of her kerchief, their revolution was on. Failure had taught the assassins the Tsar might escape one suicide bomber. Sophia brought four. And one of the revolutionaries throws a grenade, and it explodes, but the Tsar's carriage is actually bulletproof. It was a gift from Napoleon III of France. It protected the Tsar, but then the Tsar made a fatal mistake. He got out of the carriage to tend to the wounded, and a second revolutionary had a second grenade. Skull shattered, legs blown off, Emperor Alexander Nikolaevich Romanov asked to go home to the Winter Palace, where the Tsar Liberator bled to death. The revolutionaries believe that a new era has begun that the people have been liberated. They truly believe this. And it doesn't take very long before they find out that in fact the opposite has occurred. Tsarist repression returned with a vengeance. The murdered Tsar's son and heir, Emperor Alexander III, rounded up Sophia and her accomplices and had them hanged. On the site of his father's assassination, the new Tsar raised a masterwork of Russian architecture the Church of the Savior on Spilled Blood. But the crown jewel of his father's reign, the Tsar Liberator's plans to share power with a legislature, he rejected as folly. Under the despotic new Tsar Alexander, reform was finished. Starting in 1881, what you have is a recoiling uh, from any of the progress, political, economic, social progress, that had occurred in the rest of Europe. And to close the curtain like that meant that you were opening the door to revolution. Six years later, remnants of the Narodnaya Bolya plotted to kill the new Tsar. Their plans were discovered and the ringleaders were hanged. One of the executed revolutionaries, Alexander Ulyanov, left behind a devoted younger brother, Vladimir. Inspired by his elder brother, Vladimir Ulyanov would soon remake Russia under his revolutionary nom de guerre, Lenin. In 1894, Russia was a land hurtling into the future. In 30 years, the empire had built nearly 30,000 miles of railway, a rate that eclipsed any other nation. Industrial output was soaring. Peasants were flocking to new jobs in the factories, turning provincial towns into crowded urban centers. But as Russia industrialized, a working class emerges in the big cities, especially in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Kiev. And uh, at the same time, Marxist ideas begin to trickle into Russia. The capital of St. Petersburg was now home to a million souls, including a young radical lawyer, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, Lenin. Like many revolutionaries, Vladimir Ulyanov was a child of Russia's educated elite, the son of a provincial school superintendent. His brother's execution for revolutionary crimes propelled Lenin into the radical struggle. 
In 1893, he came to St. Petersburg to help organize a Socialist Workers' Party. He arrived at a fateful time. Tsar Alexander III was near the end of his reign, 13 years of political repression and economic expansion. The following year, Alexander died and left the crown to his 26-year-old son, Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov. From childhood, Nicholas showed little interest in government or initiative to rule. Neither his reactionary father nor his conservative tutors prepared the Tsarevich to grapple with the changing realities of a modern industrial world. I think that Nicholas II felt himself completely unprepared to be Tsar. He got a lot of positive reinforcement with that idea because people around him also believed that he was unprepared to be Tsar. Dreading the overwhelming burdens of leading the world's largest empire, Nicholas reached out for his soulmate, the young German princess Alex Victoria Helena Louise of Hesse. Although she was the grandchild of England's Queen Victoria, the future Tsarina was no better suited for the burdens of rule than her husband. She was so shy that she, was, she would sit there and just tear at her gloves. Public appearances were agony for her. She wanted seclusion, and the Russians interpreted that as a disinterest in the plight of the Russians. It was, she was just seen as an arrogant, uncaring German. With the nation officially still in mourning for Alexander III, Nicholas rushed into marriage. His German bride took the Russian name Alexandra. People muttered that the new Tsarina had arrived behind a coffin. Nicholas was crowned in the Kremlin amid splendor meant to bond the Tsar with his people. Instead, the opulence only underscored the divide between Nicholas and his subjects. After more than 30 years of forced industrialization, Russia's working poor were as poor as ever. Factories, mines and farms became breeding grounds for unrest. Radicals like the young Lenin fed the discontent. They spread Marxist propaganda and organized revolutionary cells. In 1895, the Tsar's police struck back. Lenin was arrested, convicted, and shipped off to Siberia. After his release, Lenin fled Russia for the West. But even in foreign exile, his radical ideas would continue to fan the flames of revolution. But the Tsar, Nicholas, remained oblivious to his subjects' suffering and their growing will to take action. Instead, his boldest step as Russia's supreme commander would only fuel the rising fire. On the Pacific Rim, Nicholas sought to seize new territories from China and Korea. His grandiose imperial ambitions collided with another growing empire, Japan. Alarmed by Russian advances, in 1904, the Empire of the Rising Sun declared war. The recently completed Trans-Siberian Railway enabled the Tsar to pour troops into the conflict. But machine guns and aggressive Japanese tactics sent Russia's death toll soaring. To back up his forces, Nicholas assembled a naval armada in the Baltic, 300 ships, and ordered them to sail for the Sea of Japan an odyssey of 21,000 miles. In May 1905, after eight grueling months of hunger, mutiny and disease, the Russian ships finally reached the Pacific coast, where the Japanese lay in wait. With faster ships and better guns, in a single battle, the Japanese sank two-thirds of the Russian fleet. The pride of Russia, the navy Peter the Great had founded, was all but obliterated. The war itself was not necessary. It was a terrible waste of Russia's resources. And of course, on top of that, Russia was defeated, which was a catastrophe, both for the legitimacy of the regime and for the emperor's own prestige in the eyes of his ministers, his senior officials, and indeed of the educated public. In St. Petersburg, news of the naval disaster would reach a city already in open revolt. 1905 would be a year of revolution. The Tsar's ancient right to divine, absolute rule 
was about to collide with the will of the Russian people. In August of 1904, Nicholas and Alexandra Romanov celebrated the birth of their fifth child. After 10 years and four girls, at last an heir to the throne, a Tsarevich, Alexei. To be born into the Russian royal family in the 20th century was to be blessed and cursed. Blessed with a life of privilege and luxury and cursed by history. Nicholas and Alexandra had realized their personal dream, a close and loving family. But from infancy, the Tsarevich Alexei was not well. Doctors soon confirmed the worst. The baby had hemophilia, the bleeding disease. No treatment existed. Most victims of hemophilia died in childhood. Alexei's disease was the Romanov family's curse. If the royal heir died, the empire would be rocked by a succession crisis at a time when the Tsar's prestige was faltering. Alexei's hemophilia is a secret of state. Because he's the heir, no one can talk about it. His health in general is not discussed at all. But in the streets of Russia's cities, the Romanov dynasty was already under attack as sick and out of touch. Fall of 1904 brought soaring inflation. Winter brought hunger and hardship. News of the disastrous string of defeats in the war with Japan shook public faith in the Tsar's leadership. On Sunday, January 9, 1905, a vast throng of protesters marched on the Winter Palace. Workers, students, priests. Led by Orthodox priest Yorgi Gapon, the marchers carried a petition signed by over 100,000. They asked the Tsar for representative government, freedom of speech, workers' rights, and peace with Japan. This is a non-violent demonstration. It's also non-political. The workers are not carrying banners with revolutionary slogans. Rather, they're carrying icons, and they're, they're making it very clear that they're deeply religious, faithful people who love the Tsar, who are simply trying to tell the Tsar of their plight and to ask the Tsar to help them out. The marchers refused to leave without delivering their petition to the Tsar. But Nicholas was out of town with his family. The palace guard's response was swift and brutal. Father Yorgi Gapon. A cry of alarm arose as the guards came down upon us. I saw the swords lifted and falling. The men, women and children dropping to the earth like logs of wood. While moans, curses and shouts filled the air. The palace claimed fewer than a hundred had died. Marchers put the death toll at a thousand. Whatever the truth, the debacle, Bloody Sunday, ignited a wave of rebellion. The impact of Bloody Sunday is that it shatters forever this, this myth that the Tsar doesn't know that the Russian people are suffering. By summer, uprisings had crippled factories and farms across Russia. Revolutionary councils grabbed for power in 50 cities. Armed workers threatened to destroy any factory that stayed open. Facing open civil war, Tsar Nicholas, defender of the dynasty, weighed his options. To crush the rebellion by sheer force, that would mean rivers of blood. The other way out would be to give the people their civil rights, to have laws confirmed by a state Duma. That, of course, would be a constitution. In October 1905, the Tsar bowed to reality. His October Manifesto granted basic civil rights and a new elected assembly, the Duma. 
Nicholas was forced to make certain concessions, but this was done under tremendous pressure. He hated the political parties. He hated the Duma. He hated the Constitution that he was forced to uh, acknowledge. And in many ways, he didn't acknowledge these things. In May 1906, Russia's new Duma demanded radical reform. Nicholas's response? To dissolve the assembly. After four years of tinkering with election rules, the Tsar finally got a Duma conservative enough to live with. He still believed that only the Romanov family could rule Russia, that he had a mission from God, he was on the throne because of divine right, that no one could take that away from him or his family, and if they did, it would mean the destruction of Russia. Amid all the political turmoil, Nicholas and Alexandra's greatest concern was their son, the Tsarevich Alexei. Hemophilia put the boy's life on the line every day. Any nick, any bump, any bruise would be just result in agonizing pain for this child. And it destroyed his mother. I mean, just to watch this, this apple of her eye just writhing in agony. It makes her also incredibly spiritual and mystical. And she's looking anywhere she can for, for a cure, for answers. The Empress prayed for a miracle. A close friend brought her a miracle worker, a mesmerizing Siberian mystic, Gregory Rasputin. When Alexei turned eight, Rasputin's divine powers were put to the ultimate test. The child has fallen, and it really appears as though the child's going to die. Alexandra writes by telegram to Rasputin and says, you know, the child is sick, can you intercede somehow? And Rasputin replied to her and said, don't worry, he will stop hemorrhaging tomorrow. And indeed, the Tsarevich stopped hemorrhaging. And from that day on, he was God to Alexandra. The wild-eyed Siberian peasant became a fixture in Tsarist circles, but his darker side scandalized St. Petersburg's conservative society. Women of high society in Russia had a very strict life. And here comes this man from the Russian countryside, from Siberia, just brimming with sexual energy. Rasputin really wore two faces. To the empress, he was a man of God. But other people saw the real Rasputin, whose name means the debauched one. He was greasy, unwashed, and a voracious uh, sexual appetite. He was an animal in many ways, and people saw that. Alexandra never saw that. She saw a holy man who knew how to help her with her son. To the empress, Rasputin spelled the difference between life and death for Alexei and the dynasty. But the Russian populace, who had no knowledge of Alexei's hemophilia, saw Rasputin not as a healer, but as a cancer in the Romanov family. People who wanted to have an audience with the Tsar would try getting into the royal family through Rasputin. There was an idea that if you made friends with Rasputin, that he could get you an audience with the Tsar. In 1913, the empire celebrated 300 years of rule by the Romanov family, one of the longest dynasties Europe had ever seen. But the Tsar's authority was beginning to crumble. Nicholas understood that every group in Russian society was turning against the autocracy. Within the aristocracy, the peasantry, the workers, certainly the middle classes, they all turn against him. Many of his top ministers, for example, were recommending that he somehow be more respectful of the parliament, and he, he would fire those ministers. He would cast them aside. Summer 1914. The Tsar's prestige hung at the edge of the abyss. Then, Europe exploded. World War I. Russia and Austria-Hungary clashed over Serbia. Within days, Germany, Great Britain, Turkey, and France, all the empires of Europe, plunged into the maelstrom. For a moment, the divisions tearing Russia apart were forgotten. Radicals and Tsarists, workers and nobles, as in generations past, the Russian people rallied to save the empire. 
volunteers would swell the ranks of Russia's armed forces to 15 million men. Within two and a half years, more than half that number, eight million men would be lost. Wounded, captured, or killed. With the empire on the line, in the summer of 1915, Nicholas left the capital for the front. As Russia's ruler, ordained by God, he believed it was his holy duty to lead the troops. He had no military experience whatsoever. And he also was not good at, for example, serving a symbolic role of walking around to the soldiers and, and urging them on and building their, mor their morale. When he stood in front of soldiers, according to the accounts that we had, he basically went silent. He didn't know what to say to them. The staggering losses at the front and starvation at home soured the Russian public on the war and its leaders. The fires of revolution began to build again. Lenin's slogan was peace, land, and bread. And this really resonated with, with the, the population of Russia at that time. For 300 years, the Russian people had bowed to the divine authority of the Romanov family. That bond was breaking. The Russian Revolution was at hand. On a dark December night in 1916, the infamous Siberian holy man, Gregory Rasputin, staggered out of a very private party. Rasputin's cancerous influence over the Empress Alexandra and the imperial government had infuriated even loyal Tsarists. To save the Tsar, Prince Felix Yusupov and his cronies resolved to take the mystic out of the picture. Yusupov invited Rasputin to join him for a midnight meal in his St. Petersburg palace. He feeds Rasputin poisoned wine, poisoned hors d'oeuvres, Enough poison, Yusupov says later, to kill five men. But Rasputin, who is an enormous person, shows no ill effects whatsoever. When it was obvious that the poison wasn't going to work, they turned, they decided to shoot him. And uh, he runs outside, and they take more shots at him. He was an incredibly resilient character. They drag him to the Neva, uh, cut a hole in the ice, and stick him in there. And uh, they're now sure that Res Rasputin's dead. Three days later, Rasputin rose yet again as the icy river Neva yielded up his lifeless body. But when they did find the body later, and they found water in his lungs that indicate he was breathing still when he was in the water, it was a stunning episode. Rasputin's murder devastated the Empress. Alexandra saw it as a death sentence for her son and the Romanov dynasty. But Tsarists and reformers alike rejoiced. Now, imagine the situation. World's largest country, the Tsar's top advisor, murdered by one of the elites, and the elites celebrate. It shows you the situation that Russia had, had found itself in. February 1917. With millions of men trapped at the front, Russia's economy was in ruins. Inflation made the ruble all but worthless. Food and fuel ran desperately short. Shortages led to breadlines. On February 23rd, breadlines turned to riots. The end of the empire came quickly. Nicholas lost support of the army, the police, and all of educated society. And no government can rule without an army and police force that's loyal. As army garrisons abandoned the Tsar, urban anarchy gave way to full-fledged revolution.
people since the Decembrists had been plotting revolution for almost a hundred years. Many people in this country lived and breathed revolution, dedicated themselves to it, hoped that it would come, or expected that it would come. Yet when it did come, it surprised everyone. On February 27th, Nicholas boarded the Imperial train to race home to protect his family and his crown. Striking workers trapped the Tsar's Express outside St. Petersburg. March 1st, 1917. Stranded on the rails, Nicholas II received an ultimatum from the Duma. To save the nation, the legislators demanded that the Tsar abdicate and hand all power to the Duma. For Nicholas, the very thought was sacrilege. We have to keep in mind that the rulers believed that they had been ordained by God, and so stepping down might actually be a sin against the church or might be an offense against this tradition or a religious offense. The destiny of the empire, a thousand years of history, rested in his hands. Desperate to preserve the monarchy, Nicholas tried to sign over power to his son, the 12-year-old Tsarevich, Alexei. But advisors convinced him that it would be a death sentence for the boy. Instead, Nicholas signed over the throne to his brother. With his life on the line, Mikhail Alexandrovich Romanov refused to take the crown. After 300 years, the Romanov dynasty, the last absolute monarchy in European history, had fallen. Could things have been different if Nicholas had given up the autocratic principle? Perhaps. But the key fact is that he didn't, and he wouldn't, and he couldn't. He didn't believe that he could be the Tsar of Russia without maintaining autocratic power. It's not just that the monarchy collapses, it's when it collapses that is very important. Because when it collapses really allows the Bolsheviks to exploit the opportunity and to, to take over power. One month later, another train would roll into St. Petersburg. In a sealed compartment, it carried the future of Russia. After nearly 20 years of exile, the prophet of the workers' paradise, Lenin, was coming home. In October, Lenin's Bolshevik disciples would storm the Duma. The February Revolution fell to a communist coup. Soon, Russia plunged from World War I into a bloody, bitter civil war. It's very hard to imagine that anything other than either a right-wing dictatorship, that is a military dictatorship, or a left-wing dictatorship could have emerged out of 1917 with power. Prisoners in their own palatial home, the former Tsar Nicholas and his family turned to each other. The girls, Olga, Tatyana, Maria, and Anastasia, once the darling of every officer's eye, learned to live simply. The Tsarevich, Alexei, stayed close to his mother and father. The family that had controlled Russia became pawns of the political struggle. The Bolsheviks shuttled the former Tsar and his family across Siberia like common serfs. July 1918. Nicholas and his family have been imprisoned in a modest home in the Urals. Then, new orders arrive from Moscow and Lenin. Awakened at midnight, the royal family is told they are being transported to another new residence. By now, they are well accustomed to surprise journeys. The girls wear corsets stuffed with diamonds, emeralds and pearls, the Romanov family jewels. In a basement room, they are told to pose for a family photo before they leave. But there is no photographer waiting for them. Only Red Army soldiers and a death sentence from Lenin's new government.
This is not a sign of strength by the Bolshevik. It's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of their fear that in this very difficult year for them, 1918, when the Civil War begins, they really are concerned that they might not make it through that year. So the execution of the royal family is uh, it's a way of trying to snuff out any possible resistance to their rule. After the bloodbath, the bodies were soaked in acid and thrown into a bonfire. The royal line reduced to shards of bone. There could be no survivors, no possibility to revive the dynasty. A brutally clean slate so Russia could begin again. Lenin proclaimed a radiant future. But as Russia's new masters tightened their grip, the communists resurrected ghosts of the Tsarist past. Like Catherine the Great, they seized power with a coup and murdered a hated Tsar to help legitimize a new regime. Like Ivan the Terrible, they used terror and exile to control the masses. Like Peter the Great, they dreamed of a Russia reborn through endless radical reform. Still, the Russian Empire left another far brighter legacy, a legacy prized by all the Russian people. Monuments to great achievement and enduring patriotism and the Orthodox Christian faith so tied to the nation's history and identity. Today, 